Welcome to this Deckmantel Connects workshop in which we will discuss the basics of mastering. Uh, not only that, we will go into detail about one particular aspect, but we will tell you about that soon. Um, now, we know this kind of subject can be a bit intimidating. It is for me. Um, that's why it's our goal today to um, address exactly the, those people that feel intimidated by the subject, and we will keep it as simple as possible. Um, we will try to cover the essentials uh, and to depict the actual concept of uh, mastering. So what is it? Uh, why does your music need it? And last but not least, what can you do yourself at home without having to use studio gear that you can't afford? Mastering made easy. That's basically what we will try to do today. Uh, I say we, but I mostly mean Marco Antonio Spaventi, who is uh, sitting next to me. Um, and uh, who, after listening to uh, the infamous Unit Möbius from The Hague, decided he wanted to create these sounds himself. Uh, and so he did. Um, Marco graduated as an electronics engineer in Rome and moved to Amsterdam to get his diploma in audio engineering at the SAA Institute. He started working for that same institute right after getting his diploma and became the head lecturer for the electronic music production course, course soon after. Uh, nowadays, he's a full-time producer and audio engineer in mixing, mastering, post-production and sound design, uh, offering workshops for Ableton and lecturing on subjects like synthesis and sampling at the um, uh, Abbey Road Institute in Amsterdam. That's right. Uh, among some of his clients are Robert Hoot, DJ Stingray, Egyptian Lover, Lauren Garnier, Terence Dixon, to name but a few. Quite impressive. And um, I know for a fact that um, a lot of producers in the Netherlands uh, like to work with him. Uh, because besides being an engineer, he's also a producer and artist, um, which is quite a plus when we're talking about mastering, but we'll get to that soon. Uh, Marco is a prolific producer, uh, Chicago-inspired house music, techno, synth-driven electronica, ambient, uh, with an extensive solo output releasing on labels like MOS, Slow Motion, Echo Vault, Biorhythm, Field, and so forth. Marco, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Yeah, pleasure. Um, when preparing this uh, uh, subject, um, um, you could explain to me like very clearly why for you this is a really interesting um, topic. So maybe mm -hmm. we can start with that. Absolutely. Um, well, I can tell you already that mastering sort of came to me. Um, generally speaking, mastering is not something that you uh, decide to do or prepare for. Uh, nowadays in the music industry, there is a lot of different aspects, a lot of different uh, types of jobs you can uh, you can do. And uh, I remember that for some reason I was in the studio working on uh, a colleague's uh, piece of music, and I just by instinct I cued it. Uh, what equalization does? We'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, simple words. I just made it sound a little better. Uh, what I believed sounded better. And the guy looked at me and he was like, uh, perhaps next time I have to let you master my stuff. He said this. And uh, you know, the classic moment where you're like, blink. And you thought, and I thought, uh, actually, maybe I can do this for work, you know? So uh, you mentioned earlier um, uh, producing music. And you also mentioned that being an artist uh, is an important fact and it's an important help uh, when doing this type of work, which is true, in fact. Um, in two words, I would say that mastering is some way um, a combination of uh, highly technical skills and a lot of artistic sensitivity. Um, and you have to find a way to combine the two in order, again, very simple words, to make music sound better. Maybe a, a good first question is uh, uh, to, ex to, to, to ask you what mastering is and what we can expect from, from mastering. Um, well, mastering, uh, nowadays mastering, uh, uh, it's sometimes misunderstood. Uh, one of the first things that you uh, think when thinking of mastering is I can make things to sound louder, uh, which, is, which is also the case. Uh, but mastering, you should see it as some form of uh, quality check. Mastering represents the very last stage of any uh, music production. Uh, if, you, if you want some way to identify the various stages of a proper music production, uh, you start from writing, uh, and then you've got the arrangement and performance, the recording, the mixing part, and then last but not least, you've got the mastering stage, which is just the last, last moment before something is published and released uh, into the world. 
So why is it so important? Um, if a whole music production is 100%, uh, mastering represents really just the last five. Uh, and I say it's misunderstood sometimes because people expect a lot from mastering. While mastering actually is something that has a tremendous impact on the music, if you want, uh, as a matter of fact, mastering should just be the last bit and you should present your music to the mastering engineer when you're already absolutely happy with it. So we are all in the mastering engineer world, we all say that the best mix is the mix that doesn't need any mastering. So um, to go back on topic, uh, what are things that you would associate with mastering, with the mastering concept? The first thing is um, improve the quality of a mix. So listen to a mix in a treated space, a space that me as a mastering guy know very well. I've been listening to a lot of music in the same room, in the same with the same speaker, same setup, all calibrated and everything. And I build in my head some sort of image of how things should sound to sound good. Then I listen to the mix and I make my decisions. So for example, I listen to a mix and I think uh, it's a bit dark, it's a bit bright, uh, it's a bit narrow. Uh, the balance between the instruments is not right. Uh, I can fix some resonating frequencies. I can make things to sound more exciting, more powerful, louder. Uh, there's a lot of things I can do, but the basic concept is I just need to make it sound better. If there, if there is room for improvement. In my career, I mastered, I don't know, I think a thousand plus records and uh, only a few situations I had to do almost nothing. So that's the that's the best scenario, let's say. And and if we talk uh, electronic music specifically, because um, um, I'm a bedroom producer, I produce something where, where I'm really proud of. I want to try it out in the club. Does it does it need mastering first, or can I try it out in the club? Or um, what what would you what would you advise if you if you think your track is is done, is finished? Well, if you as a producer uh, produce something, you're pretty happy with it. Um, that means that you spent time, you mixed it, you checked uh, in various systems, you even had the chance to play it in a club, and you're really fine with it, there is no inherent need for mastering. Uh, what I might think is the case where you are producing this song, and this song ends up being released among other songs, uh, which not necessarily are on the same level of quality. So that's when you need mastering. Uh, so another aspect of mastering is uh, grab a bunch of songs, which eventually will form a release and make the sound so they are coherent together. So they are, for example, at the same volume, uh, the same amount of bass and highs. They simply are just fine to be played as a whole. Yeah. Uh, so to, to answer, to go back to your question, uh, do you need mastering? Unfortunately, most of the time, yes, because being a bedroom producer, you don't have access to um, high quality speakers, a treated space. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that can happen in a room that you don't know about or a smaller room or cheaper speakers or a lot of things that can happen and simply mastering gives you that peace of mind that you know tells you okay you know what I spent hours to make it sound as best as I could now I give it to, an to another person who's gonna quality check it make it dope sound great and that's what you want yeah and as, as we said um, uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that you can actually do yourself that doesn't need to be that hard or uh, you don't need a lot of gear for it or no absolutely not no, no. The, wh what is most important to have in a mastering scenario is uh, a reproduction system so a speaker system that you know very well and that you can trust so and these can be your your regular s regular home speakers uh, it can be regular home speakers uh, with a certain extension. Well, the first thing you need really, it's a full range system. So something that goes from all the very lows to the very high. So you're not missing anything to begin with, uh, you know, from your from your speaker system. So cheap five, five inch boxes won't really do. Uh, cheap headphones won't really do. Uh, but the moment you have a decent, I'm not talking about thousands of euros, I'm talking about like something decent, you can totally afford full range and you produce a lot of music on it, and most importantly, you listen to a lot of music that sounds good, and you're sure that it sounds good, you can do. But as a matter of fact, every mastering engineer started like that. So that's how I also started. I had a pair of Mackies at home, and that's how I, my, I, how I mastered my first uh, Claro Intellecto album.
Nice. On the else, yeah. yeah, good times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and 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 when it comes to software, for example, mm -hmm. um, what is the what is the basic stuff you need to do? Um, any DAW nowadays come with a set of plugins built in, totally cool to be used for mastering. Uh, because you know the tools are the tools. You can have tools that do the same thing, but do it in a bit of a different way or with different degrees of quality. Uh, but these are the tools. So compression, we'll see today, we talk about compression. So if you compression, there's a plenty of compressors already built in in Logic. There's compressors built in Ableton Live, Fruity Loops, anything. So as long as you know what you're doing and you've got a good reproduction system you can trust, you can do mastering at home. So you don't need those, uh, you know, you see a lot of these photos with a huge mastering rig, a huge room, uh, that's cool but it's not easy to, to get such an um, environment. So you can definitely do mastering on good headphones at home yeah. between headphones and speakers and stuff like that, plugins. We, we try to, um, uh, or we promise to, uh, to, to keep it simple, but we have to have a, a, a we have to discuss or explain a few uh, terms, yeah. um, technical yeah, terms. So um, uh, what I want to start with is, um, or what you wanted to start with is, um, uh, what is what dynamic range is? Yeah. Yeah. range is dynamic yeah. range and why is it important yeah um, um to explain it in a, in a uh, easy way to understand i would as say dynamic range with uh, excitement so uh, what the music communicates to you in terms of uh, excitement in terms of uh, uh, in terms of vibe in terms of uh, punch uh, power uh, there's a lot of terms you can use but at the end of the day, what's important is that your music contains a good balance between soft passages and loud passages. As humans, we don't like things when they're always the same. So if you hear, to a, if you hear a piece of music and you're like always at the same level, always at the same intensity, always at the same energy, you won't get too excited by it. We like contrast. So we like the difference between l soft passages and loud passages. With, within a track, you have soft and loud passages. Within you a you track, play with the, you play with the volume. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what a lot of mastering engineers do, me included, is ear training. So you sit on your system and you just listen to something that you know it's absolutely great, and you get information from it. And just the other day, I was listening to Beethoven the Ninth, and it's it's a piece that everybody should listen, not just because of its history, but for the dynamic range. It goes from very very soft to very very loud. And I was listening to it, and I was listening to it quite loud. And when the loud part kicks in, so when the full orchestra is playing, you've got this impact of, of loudness, you've got this impact of energy that is not just given by the fact that all the instruments are playing at the same time, but it's also given by the fact that because the instruments are playing at the same time, the energy and the loudness goes up in a really natural way. Whereas when the beginning is, or in, in the middle, when the instruments are playing really soft, you almost barely hear it. And and that's what I'm talking about with dynamic range. So the, the this difference between a really soft moment and a really loud part, it gives a lot of emotion. Now we're talking about classical now, but you were talking originally about electronic music. Classical music is an example where the extreme, you know, where the difference between loud and soft is, is extreme. Uh, but electronic music is some it's 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 a world where you can do whatever you want. There are no real restrictions or sort of uh, to say I need to do it in a way or another but the best electronic tracks they always have a good balance between the punch so the, the the movement the energy movement of the for example the beat and the loudness so what what to our ears sound as loud how can I explain we need to look at the screen one second I think it's easier uh, on the screen here now I've got two tracks well it's the same track but one is the pre-master so what every artist should hand in to be mastered and the other above is the master now some of you looking at this might think yeah but the one above doesn't really look like a master um, well it doesn't look like a master in terms that it doesn't look like a square block because it's particular this is a master for vinyl mm -hmm. and we're talking about dynamic range and uh, dynamic range for vinyl is very very important uh, vinyl is a medium that needs movement it doesn't like things when they are flat limited so it doesn't like things that are always at the same energy it's hard for uh, for the vinyl to translate that well so 
you can see from the picture here that a good master has all these little lines. You see there are little lines sitting on top of the more dense looking part of the waveform. The dense looking part of the waveform that represents the loudness, so what we perceive as loud or soft. Whereas the little lines, the peaks, those represent the movement, in particular in this track of the beat, that sit on top of the loudness. So if you want to talk about dynamic range, we want to talk about the fact that there is a difference, clear and visible and obviously audible, between the loud the loudness of the track and the actual space left uh, to make it move. So the dynamic range. Now, if you want to be a little bit more technical than this, dynamic range, like I said, is the difference between soft and loud, but what is soft and what is loud? Well, soft would be the quietest. What is the difference between soft and loud? Soft would be the quietest moment in the song. Uh, that can be... For example, if we're, if we're talking... Um, breakdown. Uh, yeah. Synth intro. Uh, Synth intro, perfect, yeah. like a mm -hmm. breakdown. Mm -hmm. uh, moment where things stop playing and you hear the tail of all the rivers and delay, mm -hmm. classic thing used. And then comes the drop. So for all the, for all the bedroom, how do I make that drop to really kick? Well, if you're, if you're producing really loud already, and remember one important thing, you don't have infinite space inside the computer. You got a certain called ceiling. So beyond the ceiling, you cannot go. This is like your loudest. And then it's going in the red. Then it's going in the red, yeah. then it's clipping, all these things that are much more technical and uh, don't necessarily sound good. Um, so if you want your drop to have impact, if you want the crowd to go crazy at that moment, you got to give expectation and you got to fulfill that expectation. And how you do that? You do that by intentionally lowering the volume <coughs> before the drop. And you don't do that in a quick way, but rather in a slow way, for example, over a minute. Uh, there is a particular, uh, there's, I think, a Martin Garrix track, if you look at it, and the moment the drop kicks, kicks in, you're like, whoa, this is cool. But if you look at the waveform, it literally looks like this. It goes down, 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 and then the drop comes, boom, there you go. And you don't realize that the volume is going down because it happens over a certain amount of time. It's not immediate. And our brain, our ears, they're not so fast. They're like, they need a little bit of time to. So you follow the vibe. So that's where they play very efficiently with dynamic range. So you follow the vibe, so the volume goes down, down, down. So eventually you got room to blast it open when the drop kicks. This, this sounds a bit like uh, what the best DJs do, right? They take it, they take it back uh, and then... Uh, this is that psychology, yeah. man. It's like how yeah. we react. So yeah. uh, if things are always loud and then you got more bass, yeah, so cool, but... So what you're saying is basically make sure there's a there's a bit of room uh, before mastering to... Um, to yeah, to yeah. well, to well that's, that's yeah, definitely. Uh, make sure that there is a bit of room before mastering because mm -hmm. just give us a way to play with that dynamic range. Yeah. Uh, but more importantly, try to understand what dynamic range is. Try to play and understand your system so you know what your ceiling is. And that ceiling represents the loudest you can go. Yeah. And as a real, like, easy practical tip for all the bedroom producers, if that ceiling doesn't sound loud, just play louder. Because if you need loudness from your speakers, that's a good way to have the feeling how loud it is. Try it, yeah. all, all you guys home, just yeah. try to play a little bit louder and produce with louder listening. You, yeah. you will hear. It's just an automatic thing. It's like and after this, we should listen to Beethoven the Ninth. That's a, that's a, that's Sorry. Uh, after this, we should listen to Beethoven the Ninth to get the. the oh yeah, like uh, uh, if you, if you have like a good headphones or like a decent speech system, take your time, sit there. It's like seven eight minutes. Okay, nice. Sit there, play it loud, man. You hear what <laughs> I mean? Like when the orchestra kicks in, you get this shiver. Or it's like it's intense. Nice. Um, we go a little bit in depth because uh, uh, you wanted to talk about uh, uh, compression in, in, yeah, in mastering. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that also, again, I mean, we're working in Logic now, but uh, as you said earlier, you could do this in any DAW. Any DAW with, yeah. a, with a compressor yeah. plugin. Okay. Uh, there, there is various compressors. So, um, compression, because we're talking about dynamic range. So how do I manipulate the dynamic range? So how do I play with this difference between loud and, and soft? Well, the first way you can do is uh, automate the volume. So literally just get your game plugin 
and uh, you see like uh, let's see volume gain here you go gain and then you can just write a line that represents a variation of volume so if i wanted to have this drop here to really kick i would grab the volume and bring it down something like this so you see over the beginning of the break the volume starts going down progressively and then it kicks in so this is playing with dynamic range manually but this is okay because i'm doing it on a on a macroscopic level which means over the course of various seconds and minutes but if i want things to be automatic so if i want things to be machine controlled let's say i would use a compressor a compressor is called like that because it compresses the dynamic range so a compressor by definition will gr try to grab your loudest passages and will try to reduce the level automatically mm -hmm. so there are some terms you gotta get familiar a little bit with so what is gain reduction gain reduction is how much the compressor will lower the level what is a threshold let me open up a compressor plugin here what is a threshold threshold is the moment is the uh, level uh, beyond which the compressor starts working uh, imagine like we're talking now right so it's a quiet room so if i talk really, really slow really soft you can hear me and if i talk loud you can hear me too but imagine that we are talking in a crowded environment like in a restaurant i need to talk louder in order for you to hear me and that's because we've got a noise floor so the overall ambience noise which is at a certain level so if my voice goes loud and soft around this noise floor, so for example, at moments I'm talking softer, at moments I'm talking louder, you won't be able to hear me all the time. I can use a compressor, so when my voice goes above that noise, the compressor keeps it down automatically, but then, and that's when a lot of people get excited, compressors have makeup gain. So compressors have something that basically adds gain or adds volume so the concept is very simple i get my voice which variates a lot in volume i lower the top and then i grab the whole thing and i pull it up okay U using the gain so that means that all of a sudden my voice both soft and loud passages are going to sit above the crowd now you can hear me all the time and you say automatically, but I can imagine that you can also uh, adjust the threshold, for instance. Uh, oh yeah, you, ca yeah. you can automate, you can, yeah. nav you can drive it, you can do a lot of things, but the concept, basic concept is this, the basic concept is I try with the compressor to automatically control the dynamic range. Yeah. Now, this is technical. Um, practical, I can make things to sound louder, I can make things to sound more glued together, uh, which is one of the reasons why we use compression in mastering. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, just just to be clear, compression is not something you use all the time in mastering, most of the time, but it's not like equalization that you use all the time so or limiting. So, so how do you know when when to use, like b um, basic, basic rule, when, when well, to basic use Well, basic rule is um, I listen to a mix and I'm thinking the drums and uh, the, b the bass and the rest of the instruments are a bit like, they don't give you the feeling that they sit together. They are kind of a bit, on different levels they're a little bit on their own that's the first use of compression in mastering so-called glue so i'm using a compressor to gently and smoothly navigate these volume differences so to glue the instruments together how do i do that using a, mm, what is called a broadband compressor which is a compressor that works over the whole frequency range uh, which is the typical compressor it's what you find in any daw logic here comes with uh, a built-in sorry uh, a built-in uh, compressor uh, which is good enough really it's like plus this compressor even gives you a bunch of different models uh, because you know like it's like there are a lot of different cars out there every car does substantially the same takes you from place to another but you know quality speed uh, build uh, price everything so with compressors it's the same why mastering engineers go crazy with compressors because hey i can use a compressor plugin which sounds pretty good nowadays yeah. and uh, don't get me wrong i do a lot of work in the box because nowadays plugins are just really really good but i also have in the box variations in the box meaning uh, solely the box on means your uh, only entirely inside the computer yeah. Yeah, without going outside yeah 
Uh, so we got variations. So you see, I've got like logic already by default counts with like six types of compressors. Uh, what changes between this compressor is not the type of controls because a compressor is a compressor, but the sound. So the way the compressor does this operation of controlling the volume or uh, the dynamic range. Um, do, do different kinds of music need different compressors or? Uh, that's one way to put it. Mm. A um, uh, couple of classic examples, uh, the SSL compressors, like a lot of producers know about the SSL because it's history of music. That's like great on, I don't know, piano parts or rock stuff, uh, but it's not quite fast and uh, precise enough to be used, for example, on an EDM. You can use it on EDM, but most of the time, if you use another compressor with more accuracy, you get better results. And also, it's a big part of it is taste. It's like, uh, I think this would work, and I use it. Some other mastering engineers yeah. use another one. I guess this is also trial and, uh, trial and error with the error. Lots, yeah. <laughs> like, see and what you uh, like. Um. Uh, like you said at the beginning, which is interesting, is uh, if you're a music producer, you got away uh, a chance to experiment. So I learned a lot about mastering by producing my own stuff, looking for a certain sound, spending hours in just manipulating the compressors to get them sound the way I want, or simply uh, discovering things by accident. And so being an artist and a mastering engineer helps, definitely. And producing a lot of stuff helps too. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> That's what we all do after all. And training your ears. Yes. Training your yeah, ears, yeah, yeah, and understanding frequencies and all that, but that's more technical in detail. Yeah. Um, we're, go we're going quite fast, but we have limited time. So um, yeah. uh, you also wanted to shed um, a light on a few topics that are yeah. often misunderstood. A bit misunderstood, yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, first of all, the, the, the difference between compression mm -hmm. and expansion. Oh, yeah. So that's a new term. That's a new term, yeah. Briefly um, explain uh, why this is important. Expansion, like you would imagine, is already, um, as you would already imagine, is the opposite of compression. So compression, I said, compression is to reduce the dynamic range. Expansion is to expand the dynamic range. So I can make the soft passages to be even softer, or I can make the loud passages to be even louder. Um, why would you use one or another? Well, depends on the on the on the material. Depends on the mix. Um, I can tell you that uh, a lot of the time uh, a bit of expansion helps to get that excitement back. Uh, many times, unfortunately, I receive mixes to, to be mastered, which already have a lot of compression and limiting on things that the bedroom producer put on because uh, they like the sound off and they maybe forget to take them off before sending to me or stuff like that. But long story short, I get things that are already a bit boring sounding because they're kind of flat. That's when I use an expander the opposite of compressor. So I use a tool that let me increase that dynamic movement simply because it's just more exciting. Yeah. Uh, and then when you compare the master and the mix, the master seems to be a little bit softer, but on the long term, it will be more exciting. And this is also um, something that you can uh, get out, out of most DAWs? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of DAWs have uh, uh, expanders built in. Uh, Logic, for example, just because when Logic comes with this fantastic uh, uh, multipressor here, multipressor, which is uh, it just it does a bit of everything. It does well compression we, we, and expansion. We talked about like what can be intimidating, like and and if I open up a plugin like this, there's sometimes I think, whoa. Yeah, it's a lot of controls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you gotta go step by step. Yeah. Uh, we started with compression, like basic compressor, because it's something that it's out there forever and you will find compressors everywhere and once you start to understand what a compressor can do and its controls uh, you can then expand that knowledge into other types of dynamic processors like expansion for example or like this one which is called multipressor because it's a compressor or expander that works uh, multiband so here's another term that i want to shed a light on what does it mean multiband um, multiband means that um, Sorry, and we were talking multiband compression. Multiband right? compression. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, yeah. We, we we just mentioned expansion to um, clarify the term, but definitely, well, you can have multiband compress, multiband expanders. But what does multiband mean? It means that instead of operating on the whole frequency spectrum, so from bass to highs, it will operate only on a certain window. Uh, for example, the mid range. For example, the low end. For example, the high end. 
uh, why would you use multiband compression or expansion? Because you need to focus on the dynamic movement, for example, of a certain instrument or a certain frequency range. The bass on this mix is fine, the hi-hats, the top end is fine, mid-range lacks a bit of glue, lacks a bit of presence. I can grab my multiband compressor, focus on the mid-range and flatten a little bit the dynamics there to make them louder. Should I play a couple examples? So Please do, yeah. So what I have here is a, is a record I worked on recently, uh, it's coming out soon. It's a, it's a cool uh, kind of electro wrapped kind of thing. And uh, let's first of all show one second what you can do with compression and in particular uh, what it means to glue things together. So let's play. Man, whatever, I'm just, I do what I gotta do. The one do is coming through and hit you with the rhythm. I heat it up and beat it up fast and slow. Yeah, I'm on the road, feeling like I won the Super Bowl. Enough is enough. Yeah, enough is enough. All right, first of all, this, this mix is already pretty good. So this is already uh, something that will make my day funny because a good mix is always great to master but why but why why can you instantly hear yeah this, because this uh, when you hear it you already yeah. have um a great feeling of the beat a great feeling of the atmosphere uh you don't hear uh oddly placed instruments or or uh, things that sound completely out of place it's solid it's groovy it's well produced uh, it rocks so then we can make it sound even better there is room for improvement just only the volume um but one thing that i want to address for example mm, in, in this particular context is to make it sound a little bit more together like if it's like if, if you would get something like which is a bit raw and you smoothen it out you work it out to make it like more polished and a bit more like a finished product often the glue compression or what comes out of the mastering house is like the finished product that kind of feeling so let's take a listen all I do is come through and hit you with the rhythm. I heat it up and beat it up fast and slow. Yeah, I'm on the road, feeling like I won a Super Bowl. So the makeup game was really high, but listen first of all when I turn it on and off. The one do is coming through and hit you with the rhythm. I heat it up and beat it up fast and slow. Yeah, I'm on the road, feeling like I won a Super Bowl. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. The one do is coming through and hit you. So when I turn it on, the volume goes a bit down because the compressor is doing exactly what we explain so it's trying to grab those peaks those drums and it's kind of pushing them down in terms of volume and the first difference you hear is that without the compress the compression you got energy from the drums so you got that dynamic movement going on now with the compressor on you're forcing the drums to sit with the other instruments so you're heavily gluing the material which means that you're putting things closer to each other and you're also reducing the dynamic range. So then I can boost it, so I can make it sound louder. What you also hear in this case, which is something that I, I really encourage you guys to try to avoid, is the movement of the volume that the compressor in the compression introduces. So all of a sudden you hear that moments the volume goes up and then down, because you're asking the compressor to do a lot, you're pushing it. And pushing the compressor is another reason why you want to compress, is the artistic side of things. Uh, it's very easy to um, overdo. So another tip that I give to a lot of uh, uh, students, uh, uh, mixing clients and such is to compress and then back it up, back it off a little bit, because generally speaking, your judgment would give you feeling of more compression, mm -hmm. but on the long term, too, com too much compression makes things to sound a bit more fatiguing, like a bit heavier. Um, secondly, play with the various types, because even with the same settings, different types of compressor give you uh, very much different results. Yeah, so and and again, the most simple thing is this comes down to listening, listening, listening. Which you, yeah. precisely well said. Yeah. It's like you gotta focus. Yeah. Uh, you gotta focus on what you listen when you touch a knob. So you gotta some way build in your head what really compression means. Because at the end of the day, even mastering in we're not like going down with numbers. You know, we're not like oh mm, peak time mm, 60 b maybe I can compress. No, it's like I pretty much 
know what to do technically i do it until it just sounds good that's it yeah and my idea of how it sounds good luckily it's a good idea of how it sounds good like yeah. many other mastering engineers but substantially that's what we do yeah we just tweak it until it sounds good so as a bedroom producer use your ears listen to a lot of material that you know it sounds good that you can trust and build the image in your head of how things are good sounding and then be patient spend hours and hours in just tweaking until you get oh shit wait if i do this that's how it sounds so i can use it in my next production um so let's take a listen one second here the one do is coming through and hit you with the rhythm and heat it up and beat it up fast slow. yeah i'm on the road feeling like i won the super bowl enough is enough enough is enough you feel me so same settings, you can hear that when I switch compressor type, I've got more punch, I've got uh, more loudness, I've got the squishy glue, more glue together sound. So same thing, compression, but different types of compressor give you different results. Now we're talking about uh, multiband. So um, in mastering, multiband is generally used uh, to not necessarily compress in the traditional terms, but more to like adjust the tonality. So make things to sound a bit bassier, more highs more mids so if i wanted to give more mids to this song for example let's take a listen i'll switch on my favorite one of my favorite multiband compressors uh really cool uh, filter here and i already a sec, go back to, there you go and i already prepared some sort of a template like a preset that i always start with what do we see here what are we seeing it's uh, a really clear uh, example of multiband compression. All of a sudden, I don't have one compressor, but I've got three compressors dealing with bass, mid range, and highs. They do individually compression, so level, threshold, attack, release, everything, but they are dedicated to certain windows of the whole frequency spectrum or, or frequency range, as we say. So, in order to understand that, let's take a listen. So I'm soloing now each band to let you understand that this is the bass, this is the mid-range, and this is the top band. So I've got, and now I've got the power to change the level as I would do with an EQ. So you see, all of a sudden, I have got the the option to dig a hole in the mid range. By compressing it, and then with the volume control, I can make it louder. So, what did I just do? I, I used a multiband compressor to push the mid-range. And okay, pushing the mid-range is a technical term, but what does it mean artistically? Well, the voice comes much more in your face. So, I have the power in mastering to grab the vocals, simply because the vocals naturally sit in the mid-range, make them a little bit flatter, so reduce the dynamic range and then push the level. So all of a sudden I've got the same song with vocals more in your face, which generally speaking, mid-range translates everywhere. So your, your phone, your small speakers, and so that will make the vocal message to come much clearer through. Now, this is technical. Does it make sense for the song? That's the artistic decision that you have to take as a mastering engineer, as a producer. Yep. Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but if you have the controls yourself, I mean, it's maybe not so good for you because you will <laughs> you will get le less work to do but this is something as a as, as a producer that uh, as a, yeah because uh, multiband compression is not just used on a stereo file yeah uh, oh yeah we should actually clarify as well that uh, mastering always w um, w um i mean to say is when i master a song i always and exclusively have access to the stereo mix so i don't have the option to open the mix and adjust for example the volume level mm. of the vocals only or the bass mm. I still have to deal with a stereo mix, which is one file containing all the instruments. But I can make decisions, especially nowadays with the highly technical tools. I can go really deep into it. But another service that I offer a lot as a mastering engineer, which all mastering engineers do, is 
I first of all tell you if the mix is good enough because there is nothing better sounding than adjusting the mix before mastering rather than trying to fix the problem in mastering so this goes a bit off topic but definitely another good advice for the bedroom producers have your stuff around so let people listen to it let the dj friends to listen to it if you have a chance go in a club and play it play it in your car play it on your earbuds on your uh, hi-fi system whatnot if it sounds averagely good everywhere that's it you got a good mix we have a couple of more minutes so we, we gotta we gotta choose a, a topic um we can either go briefly into the difference between a compressor and a de mm -hmm. or uh the, the difference between a compressor and a limiter maximizer yeah um you decide, my friend. <laughs> I would say the yesterday. All right, cool. Yeah. Good one. So, um, the assing is some way a combination of multiband and, and uh, multiband compression and normal comp broadband compression. But why is it called the esser? Uh, because the um, the sound produced by uh, the sibilance, so the s and the f, like this kind of uh, sounds that we produce when we speak. But that also includes instruments like trumpets, hi-hats, things that have a lot of energy, like a burst of energy in a certain moment, way louder than everything else. So why do I use a de -esser? Because like the word says, it's a compressor that is dedicated to control only the energy around the S or the F. Um, we can take a look, uh, I've got this example here. At the beginning, you, you got, we got some, some speech, so we can play one sec. Everywhere I go, I keep hearing all of these, this crazy stuff about you, like, man, whatever, man, like, just let me do my thing. I don't know, whatever, but all of that shit that I'm hearing, let's... So in that particular moment, the guy was saying, shit, and he got the energy somewhere around 6 kilohertz, okay? So what am I using here now? This is a spectrum analyzer. It's something that gives you the, um, a very important piece of information, which is the level or the energy on various ranges of various points in the frequency spectrum in particular the s and the f sound sit around six to eight kilohertz and you could see it here when the guy's pronouncing that s pretty strong so what i can do i can go with the compressor and in particular i don't use just a compressor but i use a compressor designated or uh, designed to do that uh, so a de -esser. and the de has a really important feature which is present in most compressors but it's optimizing the esters which is the option to tell the compressor to uh, work not on the whole material but only on the energy in that particular range so it's focusing on the s information and how do i do that i can audition what goes into the control part so what actually tells the compressor what to do uh, i can audition that and focus on the s's so let's take a listen So let's play this moment once again. So what we're doing now, we are listening to what the compressor is going to use to decide, wait a second, there's too much energy, let's reduce the level. Or it's just fine, I'm not going to do anything. So I'm not feeding the compressor with the whole program. All of that shit that I'm hearing. But I'm feeding, um, sorry, I, mean, I need to be specific. I'm not feeding uh, the sidechain of the compressor with the whole program but I'm feeding the sidechain with what we hear right now. So it's listening only to that concentrated energy. And once that happens, there you go. All of that shit that I'm hearing, all of that shit that I'm The compressor takes care of it by reducing the level only in that moment because the S or the F are too strong. So it de the material. Why is it important? Well, because um, too much energy in the area is just simply annoying sounding very much goes into your ears and your and your brain uh, not cool for vinyl like vinyl hates strong asses so like uh, hi loud hi-hats loud cymbals loud open hats uh, loud vocals too much bright uh, vinyl simply will not take it, it just distort so i learned this on my own on my own production the beginning i send it to to to, to cutting and it comes back and it's like <laughs> There was no energy anymore from the Hyatt's, and I'm like, dude, what's up? 
And he's like, yeah, man, I had to DS the hell out of it. And I'm like, hmm, DS, says, hmm, let me see. <laughs> so you, you learn on your mistakes, but again, to wrap it up, compression deals with the whole sound. DSing or a DS deals only with localized energies around the S and the F sounds, which are sitting on a certain area of the spectrum. And then I'm sure that all the, all, well, all the listeners here will just go and dig with it because it's quite cool. Um, definitely can be used artistically, so I can push the DSer to get certain vibe, but most of the time DSing is something that it's really technical. So I use it because I know how to do it and because I think it's necessary, like in production especially. Yeah. To round it up, do you have a, um, a final tip if, if, if people are interested to learn more about mastering? What, what, is, it, what is a good, good point to, to start? Um, I think a good point to start would be to, um, uh, first of all, try to do something yourself by uh, using what we call a reference track. So something that you can always use to, ref to uh, reference your work. Um, Actually, ideally speaking, you might want to have your track mastered by somebody, get the master back after you're happy with it, and try to match it. So ask the mastering engineer, what did you use? Not particularly, not the secret tricks, but generally speaking, and get the level of loudness, the level of compression, the tonal balance, everything that makes your track to sound better. Try to emulate that and reach the level. And also, last but, not last but not least, there are there are several plugins out there in which also give you a bit of a help, because there's a a really strong artificial intelligence behind sort of adjusting things to lead you on the right way. I'm not talking about artificial <laughs> intelligence mastering <laughs> online, which <laughs> I hate, but yeah, it's another topic. No, what I'm talking about is plugins that will automatically detect in imbalance in balances on the spectrum and correct those for you or tell you simply that the high end is too loud, the low end is too, 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 too soft and stuff like that. So there's a lot of room and uh, and treat your room, so get to know your room. Try to understand uh, what your room does to the sound. Typically speaking, bedroom producer means uh, as asymmetric uh, speaker placement, weird corners, weird obstacles, small size room, which makes your bass to sound completely uneven. So once you know about that, you can produce much better. Marco Antonio, thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank um, you very much for we having can, me here. We can, we can take the time and uh, um, um, take a look at all this in, 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 uh, at ease. In depth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. I'm going to wrap up the uh, Deckmantel Connects workshop for today. Uh, thank you for joining us and hope to see you soon.